Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Philip Owende. I'm honored and privileged to welcome you all to this event. Uh, I'm interacting with you in my capacity as the co-chair of TU Dublin's working group on interculturalism. Uh, my co-chair is uh, director of EDI, Professor Vaughan Galligan. Uh, unfortunately, she had uh, pre-scheduled uh, commitment. Uh, therefore, she could not be able to join us on this platform. Uh, but she's quite supportive of the initiatives that will come out of this uh, conversation. Uh, uh, please feel welcome to what promises to be really interesting conversation uh, between our chief guest, Dr. Egun Joseph, and her scholarly challenger, Dr. Fidule Dabi. Uh, they'll be talking on critical race theory and inequality in the labor market. Before we begin, uh, uh, I just have a few housekeeping issues to note. Uh, we request you to keep your cameras and microphones off uh, during the conversation. Uh, however, uh, please feel free to add comments and questions to the chat box. Uh, there will be a Q&A session uh, at, uh, uh, in the last 15 minutes of the conversation. Uh, that is from 12.45. Uh, to ask your question then, uh, please uh, uh, raise your hand using the raise hand function and Quiver will call you to ask the question. Coming back to the context, I'm particularly looking forward to the conversation uh, as part of a much broader and a much needed conversation across TU Dublin and in the Irish society in general. In 2020, in light of protests and increased coverage of racism in Ireland, Eben and many others have spoken about the importance of education for tackling racism that begins in the home, as well as outlining more personal strategies to counter everyday racism. Ebon has also cited the need to overhaul the Irish education system to, in, to integrate anti-racist strategies into their curriculum, as well as the need for more diversity in teaching staff. The TU Dublin is currently developing a five-year strategic plan for an intercultural university with an initial focus on race equity. Therefore, conversations such as these which, in my opinion, is just the beginning, uh, will accord us the scholarly fora and guidance to developing our understanding of racial e equality or inequalities therein as we travel together in the potentially difficult terrain towards race equity. To briefly introduce our guests, joining the chief guest in the conversation today is my colleague, Dr. Funule Dabi, who is a senior lecturer at the School of Business, TU Dublin, Blanchard on campus. Finula recently completed her doctorate research on the experiences of black minority ethnic students in higher education. Therefore, Ebun and Finula should have a lot to interrogate in the conversation. Our chief guest, Dr. Ebun Joseph, is a graduate of University of Benin, Maynooth University, and University College Dublin, UCD. She was awarded a PhD in Equality Studies from the UCD School of Social Justice in 2015, and she is currently the coordinator of the First Black Studies module in Ireland at UCD, and is also the director of the Institute of Anti-Racism and Black Studies. Ebon is the chairperson and founder member of multiple organizations, including mm -hmm. African Scholars Association Ireland, the Unforgettable Women's Network, and the African Women Writers Ireland. She recently published a book on the critical race theory and inequality in the labor market, racial stratification in Ireland. Welcome to TU Dublin, Ibun. Although virtually, we are delighted that you could join us for the B conversation. So over to you, Finula, to lead us in the B conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. And hello, Eben. And you are so welcome uh, virtually to TU Dublin. I wish it was face to face. Uh, I have been looking forward to this conversation with you for some time. Um, and I should say that I first met Eben um, online last June and as she was appointed the external examiner for my doctor's research thesis. And I can say now, Eben, now that we're out the other side, I was really <laughs> nervous about meeting you. Um, and it was not really because of my research 
but I was very acutely aware of the intense passion and commitment and fervor that you do bring to your work. And I was really conscious of my whiteness and that I was researching a topic on black and minority ethnic students in that capacity. And um, you gave me some excellent insights and recommendations um, after the Viva. So I feel it was an excellent choice of external examiner. And I think we live to tell the tale because we're here to further that conversation today. So Evan, congratulations on the recent publication of your book. Um, you wrote a book on critical race theory and inequality that focuses on racial stratification in the Irish labour market. I wonder, could you tell us, Evan, to start the conversation um, in an accessible way, what is critical race theory and why did you write this book? Um, thank you so, so much for this invitation. And, you know, it was really, really wonderful, you know, reading your work, you know, um, and I think and we might get to that, you know, and I think sometimes a challenge that a lot of people find is, you know, can I as a white person, you know, talk about these issues? You know, can I as a person who is white, can I write mm -hmm. or can I research, you know, um, all of this, you know, you know, people who are from a different background, you know, and that's where we begin to look at the ethics, you know, of our work, the ethics of our research, why we do the things we do, you know, and I think sometimes it's really at the end of the day, the most important thing is why we do the things we do. Okay. One of the things I say is that if we look at black people in Ireland, you know, um, the, the total percentage is about 1.2%. So the kind of changes that we need cannot be done only by people who are black in Ireland. Mm -hmm. So that means that we need to have people who are in solidarity. It means we need to also have scholars who will work in this area. It means we also have to have, you know, um, people who will stand with the group for the impact to be made. When we look at the civil rights movement of the 60s, it worked, it succeeded, not just because black um, people went on the streets and protested, but because black, white, blue, green, red, every mm -hmm. color in between, you know, participated, you know, so yes. So just, you know, to say that it was really interesting to read your work and we might talk a little bit uh, more about that. But coming back to TU Dublin, thank you so, so much for hosting this, for facilitating this conversation, for inviting me here. Um, it's it's my virtual book tour. You know, we're making the most of uh, <laughs> making the most of COVID-19, but also it is a way, you know, the most important thing is when you write something, when mm. you develop material, when you write, you're not writing for yourself. So, okay. If, if others don't read your work, your work is as good as others engaging with your work. Mm -hmm. So in as much as this is my work, I am keen that people will engage with it. I'm not saying people should agree with it. I'm saying they should engage with it. So again, I am here, you know, to hopefully that we can have like a, you know, a constructive conversation and you people might not be able to think about it now, but do, you know, send me an email or something or find me on online as well and have these conversations. You know, when I was writing this book, you know, some key, key things, you know, that were um, in my mind when I, when I wrote the book, number one thing was to look at, you know, how can we capture the inequality that we see in the labor market? Mm -hmm. How can we explain that, you know, how I, I wasn't looking to write about racism, you know, so even while I talk about racism, when I wrote the book, I wasn't saying, oh, I want to write about racism or I want to find racism. No, I wanted to understand um, the inequality in the labor market. I observed that groups from different nationalities, depending on the nationality a person is from, their experience in the labor market was different. And I wanted to be able to articulate that. But mm -hmm. I also wanted us to start having our own Irish conversation. So many of us, when I write in my book, in my work, in my research, I had to borrow from the UK and the United mm -hmm. States a lot, you know, but I was like, I need, I mean, and I know that a lot of people have written about it, but beyond the stories, I wanted to go beyond just writing stories. He said, she said, it happened mm -hmm. and it happened. So we talk about the descriptive, 
you know? So I wanted to go beyond the description of what happened. I wanted, how can we begin to theorize, you know, that when we even look at it that we have critical race theory of education, how can we then have a critical race theory of labor markets? Because mm -hmm. every day we talk about integration. There is no integration without navigating the labor market. If people can't find work, if people cannot assess the labor market, there is no integration. So those were really the key things. I also wanted to make sure, I wanted to know that, you know, um, how we can begin to theorize it, but also give people a language, a voice to be able to um, express the things, you know, to see themselves in those stories and to look at, you know, how they can make those changes. And the truth is that critical race theory offered me all of those um, spaces to be able to do that. When we look at critical race theory, it is two things. Critical race theory is both a theoretical and a methodological framework, you know, but what it does is that it attributes um, racial inequalities to structural as opposed to individualized causes. So okay. most times when we talk about inequality in the labor market, you know, when we say 50 percent, you know, are likely to be unemployed or that, you know, people from this group are five to seven times, you know, um, likely to be unemployed. We look at discrimination. We then go. We most times we end up thinking, oh, it's one bad manager or a line manager or an HR person who is not recruiting. No, critical race theory says no, it's beyond the individual. Okay. Critical race theory says that it is um, structural reasons that there are structures that have been put in place that enables, that perpetuates um, these inequalities that we see within the system. But also another thing about critical race theory is that it says that you know, for you to be able to understand the experiences that people are having, you must also look at the particular time and the specific context. Because we say something about race, that race changes across time and space. Yeah. So what I mean by that is that what race, the way we experience race in 1906 is mm -hmm. different from how we experienced race in 1960, but it's also different from how we experienced race in 2020. So number one thing is that race changes across time and it changes across space. But then also, um, you know, so, so just looking at all of those things so that critical race theory said that for you to understand what is happening in a particular context, in a particular time, you mm -hmm. must it within that framework, but also you must take a historical view. In other words, you can't just look at racism in Ireland or the experiences of um, people who are black in Ireland or newcomers in Ireland or even our experiences in Ireland without looking at historically how was Ireland before. So those okay. are like some of the key things about critical race theory. So I think you make a really important point there, Eben, about thinking about this structurally, because a lot of the time the default position can be to think individually. I, you know, I'm not racist. This couldn't possibly be happening. So it's really important that we lift ourselves out of that and think structurally and look at the systems. And in your book, you refer to a section on Irish racism. Um, would you would you unpack that a little bit more about what exactly you, you talk about or cover there? Um, I think that, you know, um, one of the major challenges that I had, you know, when I started talking about race and when I started talking about the experiences of people in the labor market in Ireland, one of the major challenges I had was the pushback. It was massive pushback, you know, and people would resist, you know, people would push back because we had a belief about ourselves. We've told ourselves this narrative that because we um, in Ireland, because we were colonized as well, because we were racialized, not just not just on this side of the Atlantic, but on both sides of the Atlantic, our neighbors in Britain and, you know, in the Americas, you know, in the Caribbean. So everywhere that the Irish were racialized, you know, and of course we know the popular book, how the Irish became white. So that belief, that strong belief, you know, we so believed it that we also, we argue that we cannot, you know, we cannot, you know, be mm -hmm. racist, that there is no racism in Ireland. So that was one of the major challenges I had, the push back the denial you know um so but what what i then had to do was go back into our own irish pathway to look at how we in ireland going from being racialized but also beginning to racialize others 
you know, and so that it was not just that, you know, we went from the part where we were the, you know, where, where the racialized orders, we then created our own racial orders. And we don't, we can go as far back as, you know, 1906, when we had the Limerick program, you know, when we had the, you know, people from the Jewish and um, this background who came to Ireland um, and, you know, the, the experiences that we have. And I write about that, you know, in the book, you know, mm -hmm. there's a chapter in the book where I talk about, you know, how we created our own racial orders. But, you know, we, we had, you know, about 1954, where we had, um, you know, migrants who came in from Eastern Europe, you know, Eastern Europeans who came into Ireland, you know, and the way we also racialized them, we actually incarcerated them and they had to protest. So that is our own way of creating our racial orders. But even today, we have our own asylum seekers. So we have this history of incarcerating people who have come to us for protection and help. Mm -hmm. And it is very uncomfortable. See, one of the things about talking about race and racism is that it is extremely uncomfortable. Yes. People, you know, so so that uncomfortableness. But I say the only way we can learn and we can make any change is if we can stay with the uncomfortableness and we can push beyond that. That is where the learning comes from. We look at our Irish travelers as well. You know, we've racialized them. They are natives in the land, but we've racialized them in Ireland. We look at asylum seekers. We've racialized them here in Ireland. You know, so we look at even when we had, you know, the the Filipino nurses who came to Ireland, we racialized them into particular groups as well. Yeah. So we have that 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 history. And when you speak about that in com uncomfortableness, I'm just thinking about myself as an educator, and I'm sure many other colleagues who are here today as well. You know, for some people, it's you're right. It is just too unpalatable. It's too uncomfortable to talk about this stuff. And students would have said to me in the past, you know, stop poking at this stuff. And that would be white Irish students, but also students from minority backgrounds too. What what would you say to them, you know, that if if it's too uncomfortable and that they don't really want to wade into that difficulty, um, you know, what is a way around that in a classroom? Um there's honestly there's no way around it. The minute you say I don't want to stay with the uncomfortableness, you're just saying I don't want to learn. Mm. That means I don't want to change. I don't want to progress. I mean, look at it. And I, and I say, I think COVID is the biggest example we have. As uncomfortable as that mask is, we're going to have to put it on to keep each other safe. All right. Good so it's, it's like a vaccine, you know, you know, we tell you, oh, it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable, but we, we prepare it and then we poke you. We still do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay i'll keep i'll keep poking <laughs> we have to just keep poking and, yes. and but but for for as an educator i'll tell you a, a trick that i use i don't know if it's a trick but it's something i do at the beginning and i i learned that from being a counselor so in my work in in counseling one-on-one -on -one counseling i prepare my 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 clients before mm -hmm. so when a lot of people had their clients fall off i i never lost any of my counseling clients they all stay to the, in fact, I had to beg them, guys, go, 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 you're, you're well now, go away, <laughs> stop coming back. But one of the things I do at the beginning, I, I prepare them, I say, you know, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Okay. You're going to feel more pain because when I start talking to you, some of the things that you've buried are going to come up. So it's going to make you raw. It's going to make you uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. All right. So I tell them that even before we start the session. So in my teaching, when I teach black studies, when I teach anti-racism, I call it a disclaimer. So I put mm -hmm. a, a slide on and I call it my disclaimer. I remind them that what we're going to say today is going to be uncomfortable, but I will encourage you to stay with it because if you stay with it till the end, that's where the learning is. Then at the end, you decide whether to take mm -hmm. it or to leave it. But by then you're able to make an informed decision. So 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 as That's an educator, really I would say use that method. It, it always works. I like that. I like that, Eben. And Eben, how could we use your book in higher education across all disciplines? Because a lot of the time, a book like yours, we'll find it on a list in a humanities program and social sciences and modules on managing diversity in the workplace and other settings. But how could we use it so that it appeals across all disciplines, that this is kind of foundational work, and no matter what you're studying or what your discipline is? 
I, I think it is, you know, it is it, it is usable because one of the things I do in the book is that it is explained in a simple, you know, there's not too many jargonic words in there. Mm -hmm. And I break it down like it's in bite size. So you can actually follow the train of thoughts. You can follow the argument. And then there are stories in there. So depending on what people one of the things is that it can be used as a wake up call. So for whatever discipline the person is, you want to understand the basics of of race. You can see you can you, there's a chapter that explains that there. You want to understand the basics of of racism in Ireland. There is a chapter that is there that explains that. You want to understand even how we as Irish are also we also perform racism against others. There is a chapter that does that, you okay. know, then even when you want to then look at, you know, the issue of um, uh, implicit bias, a lot of people are interested in bias. There is a chapter that does that, you know, then I also talk about how we teach acceptance, you know, so I think that it is something, you know, that active on learning, you know, all of that, I think it is a basic, you know, book that whatever you're studying sciences or the arts or literature, whatever it is, I think that every one of us, and that's that's one of the things I've kind of, I would love advocate for, mm -hmm. is that all students must be given a, an understanding, a basic understanding in race, racism, anti-racism, how to manage difference. Yes. It should be an, in, in, you know, an entry point. What you find is that you know, people until they become managers, you know, then they attend one hour of unconscious bias yeah. training. It's not going to change the world, yeah. you know. Yeah. I'd even add to it, Evan, an entry point, but also an exit point that it should be in a graduate attribute that, you know, employers want this competency and, and ability uh, or, or other organizational settings as well. And Evan, can I ask, can white people ever really understand what it is like for black people to live, to work, to study or to navigate a predominantly white country? Can we ever really understand? Um, we can try. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I think that, you know, to the level that we can understand it, I think that is enough. That is good enough. You know, if, if people's minds are open to hear it, they can begin to understand it. I mean, like you would ne unless you've actually gone and pushed the baby out of your body in a, you know, in a maternity ward, you won't understand that mad pain that you almost tear your hair out. Right. But you can still empathize. We can still understand what it is like. We're like, oh, my God, this little big thing came out from your body. So we can understand that up to a certain level, you know, but also I, I think that as, as an educator, what I do in a lot of my lectures, in a lot of my work, I try and paint pictures that help people to walk in those shoes. There was, um, I've forgotten his name now, but he's a comedian. And he did a very interesting um, exercise. And he asked everybody in the room, and he said, anybody here who wants to be treated as black people are treated in America, please put up your hand. Not Lenny Henry, was it? No, <laughs> no it wasn't, no. It was one, uh, one I've forgotten his name, but he's a, he's, he's a little bit smallish, you know, he's black and uh, he's Kevin he, Hart. Not Kevin Hart, the, the, the one slightly, okay. taller, slightly taller than Kevin Hart. <laughs> Spot prize if someone gets it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah, but he did that, you know, so, so yeah, but so those are key ways, you know, that mm. even while we say that black, white people cannot fully understand it, when we ask them that question, then you can actually see that on a on a level we do understand it mm -hmm. we just yeah. try not to understand it when we want to bring change so the only time white people don't understand what what black people experience is when we're talking about putting affirmative actions in when we're talking about addressing anti-racism when we're trying to call it out when we're trying to actually change it that's the only time white people don't fully understand what it is like mm -hmm. to be black. Because if you don't, if I ask you, any one of you wants to be treated like black people are treated here in Ireland, how many in this room right now are going to put up their hand and say, yes, mm -hmm. treat me the way you treat black people in Ireland? The unemployment rate of black people is between 43 and 63 percent. If we had that unemployment rate as our national unemployment rate, there will be a national crisis. We will save your national crisis. So why is it okay? Why are we comfortable 
with yeah. black people in Ireland having that high unemployment rate. So that's it. So people who unfollow yeah. me on Twitter because I talk too much about black people, I'm like, yeah, if your population, if your community have an unemployment rate of between 43 and 63 percent, you too, you will be talking as well. <laughs> yeah, it's a really profound question when you ask it like that. I think it really, it really, you know, just hits, it hits hard and it hits home exactly what you, the point you're trying to make. Uh, the book is a must read by all account, uh, by all accounts, Eben. Um, and just in the context of TU Dublin, we have started work, as Philip alluded to, on a five year strategic plan for an intercultural university with an initial focus on race equity. What do you think is a deal breaker for us in terms of what we need to include in that plan that, you know, something you'd be quite shocked if you read the plan and you didn't see X, Y or Z in it? What, what do you think is a deal breaker that we should be giving ink to or that we should be giving time to in that plan? Um, I think that, I mean, like any plan that does not also include uh, for me, you know, if I'm reading anything, I'm only looking for one thing that they mentioned race in there. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So if race has not been mentioned, you know, if race is not included, you know, because when you say women, when you say women and you've not mentioned black women, traveler women and all of those, then again, mm-hmm. that's white feminism. So I'm like, OK, so you're not protecting us. You're not protecting all women. You know, so I think that a key aspect of it has to be to look at racial inequity, you know, yes. within the institution. It has to not it there must be um looking at representation how can you make that happen it's i I don't want people to tell me that oh we know there's a problem we all know there's a problem so key thing is what specifically are we going to do to make it happen for example if we look at if we look at you know um uh, you know we we recognize that there's not enough female professors in ireland so what Mm -hmm. are we doing we have actually put female professorship jobs only so why, why can we do that for female? Why can we not do that for ethnic minorities? You know, if 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 24%, I don't know what percentage is ethnic minority, but if 24% of your college is ethnic minority, then your ethnic minority staff representation must also show that. So that document must also show how you're going to tackle representation. But it must also go because... You can't just bring people in to come and help you um, look at your curriculum, how you can decolonize your curriculum. If the people um, who have the power to make the decision, if if these voices are not on the table, then no real change can happen. Do you understand? Of course. We contract people in, you know, so their voices, they are not really at the seat of power. They can't make those changes. So for me, those will be like real deal breakers. If it is not mentioned there, don't call it ethnicity. Okay. Don't call it nationality. Call it what it is. It is race. The discrimination that black people experience in Ireland it's not because of their ethnicity. Their ethnicity, most most of them, many of them now are Irish, you know. Yeah. My two boys are Irish, you know. But, yes. So it's not their ethnicity. It is it's the color when they go out on the street. And that's what I talk about in my work, that you can change your racial, um, you can change your economic positioning, but you cannot change your racial strata, you know. Okay. So that So we must be cognizant of, of that. And actually, you've reminded me of something, you know, language and terms and words can can off, always be, you know, cause tension and they can be quite divisive. And one of the first obstacles I suppose I encountered was the term I was using to describe the research participants. And I just wanted to ask you, Eben, the term BME, Black Minority Ethnic, mm. I've always been uncomfortable with that term because I think it really does categorise people um, in terms of higher education. It doesn't include all our students that have ethnically and culturally diverse backgrounds. What do you think of that term? Do we need a different one? Should we be using it? Is it offensive? Is it inclusive? Where yeah. do you stand on it? I don't think it's offensive, but I hardly use it. You know, mm-hmm. I, I don't use BME. I, I don't think I use BAME. You know, I don't use any of those ones. I just call it what it is, black. Black, you know, write it out. Black, ethnic, minority. It's three words. It's not too big, you know. <laughs> Rather than BME, you know, so don't, you know what I mean? It's not too yes. much. So, so yes. black, you know, black, yes. traveler, ethnic minority, you know, mm-hmm. it's not too much, you know, to yeah. write, you know, write black, write white, you know. Yes. And I think, you know, for me, so it's constantly creating those boxes that we put people into. Yeah. 
But the truth of the matter is that every term is problematic. Mm. You know, so every term. So even when I say black, it's going to be problematic for some people. Do you know? They're all contested. They're they? all absolutely contested because yes. that's because race in itself is a contested um, issue. You know, yes. it's, it's problematic, you know. So you were just trying to make the most out of a very problematic um concept that whole idea of race race never came out from a good place race was created to 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 develop a hierarchy and mm -hmm. anytime you put a hierarchy you already have introduced inequality and every time there's inequality there's going to be strife there's going to be you know it's 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 problematic from the beginning so anything you do with that whole concept of race is going to be problematic but how can we make the most of it so for me i use black but when i use black i also say white the okay. reason black is problematic is because people just talk about black people then they don't talk about white people i'm like no you if you talk about black people then you need to talk about white people as well you know so so that you know that means that it's every one of us we we form this continuum you know i look at it as a horizontal continuum of humanity you know, where there are some who are black, there are some who are mixed race, there are some who are white, you know. So it's a continuum, it's horizontal, not a not a vertical where some are superior and some are inferior. So that's why race is problematic, because we use the horizontal where some are superior and some are inferior. Right. But if you use it this way, it means that it is a spectrum of color, not yeah. better. You know, race is problematic because we, we think one group is better. Yes. And because we think one group is better, it means we provide more resources. They have more access to resources, more power, more mm. position, more authority. That's why it becomes problematic. And Ebon, one of the standout pieces of feedback you gave to me on my research was this idea of developing a race consciousness. Um, and your advice to me was to pull back a little bit on the C, the critical race theory, analytical, you know, all those things I was throwing at my at my research. And instead that it was a much more nuanced thing that needed to be developed. And that was that we needed to develop a race consciousness. And I did struggle with it initially uh, until I had to, you know, weave it in and get it approved. Would you describe what exactly that means in the context of a higher education campus like TU Dublin? How can we develop a race consciousness? Um, and that that idea of a race consciousness actually comes from critical race theorists. You know, um, the 24 people, you know, we, we, we credit um, critical race theory to those 24 people who came together in the United States, you know. But one of the things that they defined, they insist that, you know, you must have a racial consciousness as a necessary element, you know, to fostering um, and understanding um, this contested position of power. All right, that that racialized people are in a position of power. Racism and race is about power. Mm -hmm. It's not about I don't care. Call me the N word. I really don't care. Right. The, the N word doesn't hurt me. What hurts me is when you have the power behind it. OK, when you have the power to to Im impute your attitude of racism. That's where that's what it makes the difference. You know, they can call you names from today to tomorrow. It makes no difference. But some people who call you names actually have a power behind it, yeah. you know. And so it is that unequal power that that's where that's what that's what gives racism its its power. And all of these are backed by policies. They are mm -hmm. backed by laws. And so critical race theory says that for you to really, really make changes, you must have you know, you must have um, a, a critical race consciousness. Okay. So for me, I began to look at, and, and what I was looking at myself, before I came to Ireland, right, I didn't have this much level of critical race consciousness because right. when I was, where I was born in Nigeria, I was born in Nigeria, I did not have to grapple with my race on a little level. I grappled with gender. But when I crossed over and came into Ireland, I became non-national. I became immigrants. I became a black woman. I became so many boxes that were thrown mm. at me, you know. And then I began to notice that, you know, I was not value. My, my value was not just based on my abilities, but on these boxes. We are used to determine all of those things. And that began to help me develop a race consciousness. 
So yeah. this, this consciousness are for in my book. So what I did was now look at myself and say, how did I develop race consciousness? Because critical race theory is a theory still in um, development. So okay. it really encourages us to keep developing it. So while they tell us to develop a race consciousness, they don't tell us how to develop. Yeah. So what I did in this book and another book I wrote with um, Monya Luke and um, and uh, Barbara O'Toole, I put a chapter in that book as well. I talk about how to develop race consciousness and I mentioned four things. Number one, for you to develop race consciousness, you must understand the changing meaning of race. So you must first understand race, that it is not a fixed attribute, that it is an attribute that changes, it is a social construct. You cannot develop race consciousness just because you are black. Okay. Some people think that, you know, so we call it that, you know, not every skin is skin, you know, so sometimes you can see some people who are black, you know, they have no race consciousness at all. Yeah. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. So, so some of us develop race consciousness from our experiences, right? Okay. And from how we had to build ourselves and learn. So as a white person, you are not going to experience what a black person has experienced. So how can you develop it? That's what I'm talking about. You have to begin to build yourself to understand the changing meaning of race. That is number one. The second thing that you want to then try and do is to understand that race is hierarchical, that yeah. the way race operates, it doesn't just, op it operates in a hierarchical system and that it is a system of domination. The minute you begin to understand that it is about domination. So when you think about TU Dublin, no matter how nice and how amazing you are, there is in existence right now and a system of domination. So for you, so as an institution, for those who want to do that job, you want to see that what is our system of domination in TU Dublin? What is the hierarchy within our organization? Who is at the top and who is? So take my book and look at it. And it shows you, you were asking the question, how can we use that within our school? That's exactly how you can do it. Look at your unit, look at your school, look at your department, who is at the top and who is at the bottom. Don't just name it. So what my, mm. why my book is, is, is different is that I actually name it. I don't just tell you some at the top. No, I tell you who is at the top. I also tell you who is at the bottom. Right. And then when you see that you cannot run away from it, you cannot hide away from it. So 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 really understanding that there is a stratification. But then the third thing is then to look at, you know, um, you know, so the third thing then is to look at, you know, within your own organization is how you manage difference. So this racial consciousness that is required is that we must understand how we manage difference. I, I, I got this race consciousness by looking at how in Ireland, how we manage difference. Okay. I saw that the more different you are, you are either incarcerated in direct provision or you are 60% unemployed. So that's how we manage difference. So, you know, so those are some key things, you know, of, of mm -hmm. how to develop that race consciousness. You spoke it's there. Uh, it's all there. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> My Christmas uh, holiday sorted. Um, you you mentioned the N word there, and I'm sure there's been plenty of other uh, terms hurled at you. And I suppose your work, Eben, allows you to combine your research, your scholarly research, with activism. Um, it's 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 a lovely combination, actually. But I have noticed at talks and events that you have commented uh, that you've received death threats because of what you do and what you say. And um, this surely must take its toll. And I just wondered, how do you deal with this and and still keep? Um it, it is it is it is quite quite challenging you know and um, i started i mean like i started 2020 with two two troll accounts you know so i'm like come on guys i'm just a little girl stop it you know <laughs> like i'm not even famous why should i have troll you know troll accounts you know what i mean but yeah you know they i have troll accounts so i started 2020 like on the 2nd of january that was my welcome to 2020 you know and i had two troll accounts developed and you know they they put up very sexualized things about me and, you know, all kinds of things. And sometimes I get emails, death threats as well. So it, it is worrying. It is scary. But, you know, at the end of the day, I have to ask myself that, you know, we need to stand for something, you know. And I ask myself, if not me, then who? And the same thing I, I, I say to all of us who is on the call today, if not you, then who? 
If not yeah. now, then when? You know, because critical race theory, most times, you know, um, why critical race theory was developed was because people were saying, oh, we should wait for that incremental, you know, that incremental increase. But critical race theory says, no, we need it now. We can't be waiting mm -hmm. for the incremental, you know, the same way many people say, oh, you know, the next generation. I'm like, no, look at France. France yeah. has two, three, four generations. You know, they are still, you know, the migrant people there are still, you know, very, very marginalized. It is still a completely separate system, you know, so it's really looking at all of those things. So, yes, I have hope. While I think it is crazy, difficult, challenging, imagine in 2000, and I was saying on a call I was on yesterday, I say, imagine in 2006, you know, if we ever thought that a black person would be the president of the United States, we would have said, oh, come on, get off your rock. Yeah, yeah. That's a joke. It's not possible. But yeah. two years after, it happened. And we did not just have Obama for one term. We had it for two terms. Do you understand? Yes. So yes. for me, it is that hope. I still, in as much as I'm threatened and challenged, I hope the big man up there will keep protecting me. <laughs> You know? <laughs> but I, I believe, you know, I have that hope, that tiny little hope. And for me, that's what keeps me going. You know, that it's a great word. Never give up hope. Yeah, no. it's a great word. And Ebon, uh, microaggressions was a strong finding in my research, and it was the accumulation of, of microaggressions over time for our BME students that can take its toll and have an impact um, on them. And there was a question from a colleague uh, that they wanted me to ask. Um, she, she put it so well, like Irish people will ask a lot, other Irish people, where are you from? Uh, you know, we would say it's part of our culture and we were trying to guess based on their accent what, what county in Ireland that they're from. It's a way to ice break. It's a way to engage with another person. Uh, we don't tend to find it offensive unless you've missed, uh, unless you, you've, you call the wrong county that they're from. But it's generally in, in good humour and jest. Yet, where are you really from? can become a microaggression for people who don't look traditionally white Irish stereotype. Why is that so offensive? Should we not ask that question at all? Um, you know, if I was in conversation with you and I met you for the first time, you know, after a few minutes, after a few seconds, I could note from your accent that you didn't grow up in Ireland. And if I said to you, where are you from, Eben? Would Is that offensive? Is it is it a question that we shouldn't ask? Um, where are you from is fine is where are you really from that's the problem because when i tell when you ask me where are you from and i say i'm from balia right and i tell you i'm a i'm a balia girl or i'm from tala or i'm from you know d4 or whatever or i'm yeah. from Donegal, then that's 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 it you know so if you have a different question ask the question okay so so the, the the reason it's problematic is because you know we call you out on the blah and then we don't want to be called out so if you want to ask me i notice that your accent is not from dublin where is it from do you My understand God. so don't yeah. say yeah so you can say i notice your accent is different from mine mine is a dublin accent where is your accent from ask the question that's the question yeah. you want to ask then i choose to answer you or not you want to say, I noticed that your skin color is black, right? <laughs> what is your connection with Ireland? Ask the question. If you're not right. bold enough to ask the question, do not. That's where the problem is. Because when people tell you they're from Donegal, then you say, oh, no, I mean, like, where are you really, really from? Where is your grandfather from? Where yeah. is so then ask it. Say, you know, OK, I'm curious now. What is your connection to Ireland? Because I see, you know, are you first generation Irish? Are you second generation Irish? Ask like an like ask like an enlightened person. Do you know what I mean? You and know? that's okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I first, you know, so if so for example, my kids are, you know, they are, you know, they are Irish, you know. So if you ask them where are you from, he will say Dublin, you know, I was born in the Rotunda, you know. Yes. So but if you ask him, you know, if you're having a conversation, say, okay, I notice your skin color, but also I notice your accent, you know. Yes. So tell me what's your connection to Ireland? Do you know what I mean? Like, yes. you know, are you yes. are you are you native Irish or are you, do you understand? So that means you are not trying to locate them as asylum seekers or you're not trying to locate them as outsiders yeah. do you understand because most honestly the truth is most people are actually just trying to locate you yeah. how did you is the question really is like how are you here yeah. what is the legal right to be here what gives you permission to be here so that's exactly. the, so when you ask us where are you from i'm not hearing where are you from i'm actually hearing what is your right to be here what gives you the right to be yeah. here 
Do you have legal right to be here? Are yeah. you a, are you illegal? So that's those are the questions we hear. You okay. Understand? <laughs> it's a very refreshing reply the earlier part there when you when you say just ask what you're asking you know really yeah. unpack it and and be clear what you're asking Evan we're coming up to sort of question time and I, a few colleagues had sent me some questions um in advance and I'm just going to ask if Lindsay Dowling is there from the library services I know Lindsay had a question around decolonizing the curriculum um Lindsay do you want to come in at this point with your question yeah, yeah thanks William Fanula this has been Absolutely brilliant. Thanks so much, Evan, for the time and Fanula as well. Uh, Fanula, you definitely have a career in broadcasting ahead of you if the academia doesn't work out. Um, Evan, myself and Fanula have recently gotten funding um, for the library, well, kind of across uh, School of Business and Library project in Blanchardstown around decolonising the curriculum. And our plan is to use one of Fanula's modules um, to um look at kind of the diversification of resources and encouraging students to so i suppose where the library comes in is to is training students in kind of um, search and research methods to be able to find and assess different types of resources i suppose my question my question is kind of two part one is like how would you how would you recommend we approach it from a library point of view more generally the decolonization aspect and how the library can kind of underpin that body of work and also and i suppose if you have any kind of best in show examples of that and then also you know a lot of um kind of non-eurocentric cultures and resources aren't necessarily the traditional resources they're not necessarily you know like books and journal articles so do you have any advice or insight into how we deal with, you know, for example, like oral histories or visual histories and how those can kind of be incorporated into a library setting and perhaps into modules as resources as part of the decolonization program? Yeah. Um, again, I mean, there's a lot of interest in decolonizing. So, but one of the things I say about decolonization that it's not just about just throwing things in there. So we need to be careful that we don't just throw materials in. But I remember that colonization is about power. And I keep going back to that is about power. So that if you've decolonized by just increasing your offering and putting you know, materials from migrant um, authors or black authors there, it's not still decolonized because you still present that group powerless. So it is the yeah. way we present that group without power. It is we take power away from them. We make them the object rather than the subject. So that so the decolonization is really starts from there. The second thing is that don't decolonize until we decolonize the minds of the authors, the minds of the educators themselves. Because if your mind is decolonized, the materials, your presentations, your teaching, everything will be decolonized in itself. It will happen when you be, then you do. You see, most times what we want is we want to do. It's like 20 steps. I'm like, no, I can't teach you 20 steps. That is performative. That is for the optics. But I can teach you how to be. If I can teach you how to be a particular way, then you, it will come naturally to you because what I will do when I'm not there, you will do that exactly. Do you understand the way I will respond yes. to it? But on the practical level of it, I think that, you know, even having sections, you know, within it, you know, we have some amazing authors, you know, we have the most popular ones, like people like, you know, Chimamanda, but, you know, go back to people like Wale Shoyinka, you know, the, you know, just some, some amazing, you know, authors, you know, from the African continent, but yeah. also, also, it's not just in literature, you know, we want to begin to look at even in architecture. What is African architecture? Introduce that into it so that architectural students, when they want to write their research, their dissertations or their work doesn't just start from, from, from Western um, understanding of architecture. You've been able to give them something about the Egyptian architectural you know, designs, yeah. their history. So in everything, even in medicine, we talk about medicine today. We start, you know, our, our knowledge of medicine start from the Western knowledge. I'm still like, no, stop it. Let's go back to history. Let's go back to some of the vaccines that were, and they are, you know, find materials, you know, find those traditional methods that they used, you know, and then let us increase all of those things. So I think that, I, I think that, you know, there are materials out there, you know, that we can, we can add to the work, you know, to that library. Yeah work you know that makes the difference you know and it's representation 
um, make sure it is visible, not hidden in a corner or not Ooh. hidden in somewhere like an afterthought, you know? Yes, Chino Achebe, you know, so somebody mentioned Chino Achebe, you know, it's a massive, you know, he wrote Things Fall Apart, you know, so those are amazing books, and I think it's been done in, in Irish now, if I'm sure, if I think, you know, I think Chino Achebe's Things Fall Apart has been written in Irish now, you know? It has, yeah. So, so those those kind of works need to be, so when we even have like, you know, literary day, make sure that, I'm just saying, go out of your way to include those voices. Find them, you know, when they yeah. need me to come on the media, they know how to find me. So find, find, do you understand? So find, find them. Don't just wait for them to, to come and apply because, uh, you know, our networks, you know, I was speaking with Tukufu Zuberi and he talked about our networks. He says, if our networks are hierarchical, if our networks are racially stratified, then everything we attract will be racially stratified. So you must make sure that in developing this, that the people that are involved, the materials that are involved are not just from your networks. If not, you will only include that hierarchy and, you know, that's, that group favoritism, you know, somebody put it up on Twitter. I thought it was really gas. You know, we're talking about um, um, diversity higher. And then he came up with this new idea of, you know, homogeneity higher, you know. So again, so I'm just saying, make sure that all the materials that are there are not just from Siobhan or, or um, who, what is another Irish name now? Sean. Sean, thank you. Make sure it's not only Siobhan and Sean because that would be your di that would be your homogeneity homogeneity production. Make sure you have Ebon or or uh, you know all of those funny names. You know. Yeah. Thank <laughs> thanks, you, Ebon. Thanks, Lindsay, and thanks, Ebon. Um, i my colleague uh, Quiva and Noreen. I think I've been keeping an eye on the chat box. Are there questions? that people would like to ask from there or um, they'd like to come in? Or maybe I might ask you, Fionula, as well, you know, because I read your work, you know, and I, I saw, <laughs> I know. <laughs> You're like, no, it's not me. But I think know, my connection is bad, Evan. <laughs> I read your work and I thought it was very interesting because you used a lot of stories, you know, you were able to capture um, that as well. But why was it important, you know, for you not to lump all the research participants together? Because I noticed you didn't do that. So I was happy you didn't do that. But why? Just explain to us why. Why was that important? Sure, I'll try and answer that. I suppose initially I had, as you said, I'd lumped all the research participants together and they did come from an African origin, an Asian origin, an Eastern European origin. But subsequently, as as I got into the analysis of the questions that I asked, I realized that I needed to know who was racialized and who was not, um, you know, so racialization categorized according to their race, because not all the participants in my research had the same experiences. So it was really important for me to isolate the experiences of the predominant group, which, which happened to be uh, the black African students and to show how it is different for them as they navigate the, the campus at different times. Um, so initially, as I said, I hadn't split the findings like that but I really did need to go back and do that uh, through a second pass and, and what was what was um what was your interesting finding sorry and um, I think the key finding for me the one that has always stayed with me well two really that the staff um findings were in complete opposition to the students so the students felt that overwhelmingly the campus was an inclusive place until I dug down a little deeper but actually all the staff that I interviewed and spoke with uh, would said the exact opposite that they could see the exclusion the painful moments of exclusion and discrimination in their classrooms or around the campus so it was interesting to see the stark contrast there and also how one of the research participants a student referred to himself as an oreo biscuit as in that he was black on the outside, he was from Africa, uh, he wasn't born in Ireland but had moved to Ireland, was here for a long time, uh, but that he was referred to as white in the middle and that he sounded white, he acted white, whatever that is. Um, and I suppose that really showed me how complex this whole area is and how he had internalized it because he, he viewed that as a badge of honour and that has really stayed with me um, all the time. And, and I write about that in the book, how how experiences I talk about when people I, I talk about the the labor market um, process, you know, the migration to labor market process. Come with expectation, the expectation goes to experiences, but that based on the experiences that people have, they begin to negotiate that and some develop what I call minority agency. Some adapt, some collude and some resist. But based on the experiences that people have, it reconstructs their identities. And so some actually can become racist, you know, to people who look like themselves. 
some can also become um you know superior begin to feel superior or some might become demotivated so experiences actually reconstructs people's um, identities so really key and i think that that is one area that we are not aware of how people's ex it doesn't leave them the same you know and, and so 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 it's really important i thought it was very interesting when i read your work you know that you know that's you know, the, the dissonance or the, the disconnect between the experiences. And I think it's something we find a lot in Ireland because people expect you to be the good migrants. So as a good migrant, we feel we should tell a particular story, but also the power imbalance. People are so afraid to say, I know the price I'm paying now for speaking out in the academy. You know, if I wasn't speaking out, I probably would be far gone by now, you know. <laughs> But yes, anyway, uh, that's just and just with, with the last couple of minutes, David, I'm just conscious of maybe bringing in an attendee or two, maybe who has a question and then to come back to me for the final goodbye, even though I could stay here all day talking to you. Um, Quiva, is there anyone I know there's a, I think I see a hand up on my screen. Um, is there yeah, someone with Daniela, So we had we actually had two questions in the chat. So we had one from Emily McAlerney. Emily, do you want to unmute yourself and ask that question or do you want me to read it out for you? Um, no, I'll, I'll ask it. Um, I, wanna, I want to thank Ibun. It's such a privilege um, to hear you speak, Ibun. Thank you so much. Um, I'm here shouting at my laptop rah, 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 like a mad thing because, you know, I, I just couldn't agree with you more and such a wonderful insight. And you make everything sound simple in terms of, you know, we can do this, we can overcome it. It just takes an attitude change. And, and I really appreciate that because sometimes these things seem um, totally overwhelming. But the question I had, uh, one of the questions I had was um, yesterday, I don't know if you heard it, but uh, Leo Bradker was on radio and he publicly denounced racism. And I kind of had a little laugh to myself because I wondered, can you possibly denounce racism when you preside over the direct provision system? in Ireland. Um, is it is there in any possibility that you could ever denounce racism when you're in charge of that system? Um, and also when there's no diversity in your party, pretty much, and in in the Dáil and very little diversity in politics at all. So I'm wondering, is any politician in a position to denounce racism in Ireland? No, and, def and definitely not, not definitely not Leo Varadkar. Like because when he was in power, he absolutely did nothing for minorities. He did nothing when he, the minute he set his cabinet for me, that was the beginning. I was like, oh my god, this guy is not going to do anything. And true to form, he did absolutely nothing. He did not even. He only began to mention racism just like the last leg of his power, his um, his position in, in, as as Tishok. Do you know what I mean? So he did not mention it, you know, so no, no, completely. He's clueless. I'm sorry to say, but he's totally clueless because he's a overprivileged child when he was growing up because he had parents who worked really, really hard and buffered and protected him. But in my in my work, I talk about how, you know, our experiences of racism reconstructs us. So one of the things that happens is that people become so reconstructed, they run away from that community. They denounce the community. They become like the Oreo outside by white on the inside, you know? So, and I think for me, when I look at him, he has become that, you know? And so he has seen himself. So he's portraying that, like somebody who has no idea of the daily experiences of people of, of racism. So he cannot come now and begin to denounce it. He has not done any work to address it. In the whole time when he was in office, he did absolutely nothing. So I just think, you know, there are people who are there who, while they are within the organization, you can actually see the work. You can look at their history. All I need to look is at their track record. So even as a scholar, as an academic, people reach me, they are looking for people from my community. I want to look at your work. What have you done? What did you say during Black Lives Matter? You did nothing, you know? So that means that we are just a paycheck for you. That means that my community is just for your research, you know? So again, it's about all of those things. When you look at his history, there is absolutely nothing that shows that he has understood, you know, the impact of racism. It's only now he's beginning to speak. It's, it's a little bit too late, sorry. Have we time for one more? Um, sorry, if we time for one more, um, Susanna had her hand up there first. Susanna, would you like to come in? 
<laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. And I just uh, had to laugh. I find it very interesting. And I, uh, you both mentioned the the term uh, BM, uh, BM and how how it is used. And I just find it very interesting that we have no problem to type eight thousand words policy, but we have a problem to write that we have to find shorthand for those three words. But yet we are fine with the rest, so I just have, it's always fascinates me. But I just wanted to ask you, and I, I know this is a kind of uh, interesting. You talk about uh, microaggression, and I um, uh, and we talked with, uh, with Nero before a little bit about micro insults. And I just wanted to hear your opinion. I come uh, constantly, even though I do teach equality and diversity, and some of my students are on the on this uh, webinar at this moment. Um, we talk about names and importance to to call people their the real name and spell it out. Yet my name would be constantly um, spelled wrongly by my students as well as my colleagues. Um, and it is a form of of a micro insult when you don't don't pay that attention. You don't take the time to actually spell it properly. I, if I can spell spell Fanula or Siobhan, I'm sure you can spell Susanna. Uh, so how would you deal with that? There is a thing about not constantly uh, going to uh, to people and call it out on them, but how do you how would you say to deal with those issues? Um, I I think that thank you so much, you know, uh, for the question. I think that change can only come when we call out the behavior. So remember, we're not calling out the person; we're calling out the behavior, and we must keep on calling out the behavior. And if we remember that people are learning, so it's an active on learning. And so many of us are actually like children in race. When it, uh, we are 50, we are 60, we are 40 or 30 years old, as old as we are, but when it comes to the issue of race, we're still babies in race. So the same way a child is learning to walk, they fall, they pick them up, you correct them, you let them know what to do. We need to keep doing that. That's where, so we reinforce. Silence is complicity. The minute we remain silent, then we are, we are acknowledging, we are allowing that. So. I think keep calling out the behavior, not in a bad way, but in a way that helps them to understand that actually, you know, some people will receive this as an insult. You know, this is a, you know, is is a is a is an is a, a way of a level of carelessness. It's like saying I don't care, I don't care enough to to look at it and make sure I have spelled my name is called Eban Elbow Elbow. God, I'm, I'm everything, you know. At one time in Ireland, I used to even pronounce my name wrongly to accommodate all my white friends until I realized, I'm like, stop it. You're teaching people to pronounce your name wrongly. Ebon. No, my name is not Ebon. It's Ebon. It's Ebon. I don't even know how to pronounce my name anymore because I got to start pronouncing it in a way that people could pronounce it. So I stopped. I'm like, no, I would tell them the correct pronunciation. If they can get it, that's fine. If they can't, that's fine. But now people, before they interview me, they ask me, sorry, can I get the correct pronunciation of your name? And that's good. I used to think Siobhan was Shoban, you know? That was my first, the first time I mothered an Irish name, Shoban. I was like, oh my God, what is that? It's Siobhan. I can pronounce that, Quiva, you know? So yeah, learn our names. Great. Thanks. That's great. Nula, do we have time for just one more very quick question? Sure. Ebon, can you stay for one more quick one? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> Perfect. Melody, do you want to come in there with your question? Yeah. Uh, hi, Ebon. How are you? I'm good. Uh, <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say, not that it's a question as such, I just wanted to say in looking for materials for the library, we are not just about struggle. I, you know, black people are not constituted of struggle alone. We are happy, we, are, we have romance, we have, you know, we have all other aspects of life that we enjoy. So when you are buying materials, remember that that we are not just about struggling for, for equality. We, we have so much more in our lives and that we experience, and that should be reflected in the materials that, that you're going to buy. That's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Melody. That is so powerful because every time when I'm teaching Black Studies, I always start by asking them, what do you know about Black people? Most, like 99% of the people who answer, they tell me about the Black struggle. They tell me about civil rights, about Martin Luther King. And they tell, I'm like, yeah, duh, but you do know that that is about the Black struggle. That is about when things went wrong with them. 
Black studies is about who were they before, that narrative, who are they now, what are their strengths and their weaknesses, what are the good, what are their wealth, you know, and all of that. So thank you, Melody, for, for highlighting that. I think that is really, and that's why you talk about the power balance, you know, where you, you balance the power between those two groups. That's, yeah, it's a really powerful question. We need to shift the lens. It's not all just one narrative that maybe we grew up with. You know, it's so important, Melody. Thanks for that. Uh, that 60 minutes absolutely ripped along, Evan. I can't believe we're, we're coming to a close. I have a few hardcore questions for you now coming up. Would you rather? OK, so get your um, get your helmet on, get your seatbelt on, and I want a quick fire <laughs> round to finish. So, Evan, would you rather free Wi-Fi or free coffee for the rest of your life? Wi-Fi. There's no, there's just nothing. I'm like, I call myself a Wi-Fi junkie. Like, okay. <laughs> Eben, would you rather be a full-time research scholar or a full-time research activist? Oh, scholar. Because as a scholar, I can do activism. Okay, <laughs> get both in. And for a festive twist, Eben, would you rather a massive selection box or a massive mince pie? Oh, selection box any day. Good, me too. Evan, we hope that you'll come back again to TU Dublin. I think there's so much more to talk about and so many other places for us to hear about your work and hear your voice. Um, I've really enjoyed this. I want to thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, we're delighted to have hosted you and to all the attendees for coming and for the questions um, as well. I've really enjoyed it. I hope everyone else has too. Thank you, Ebon. It was Thank great. You so much. I really love being here. Brilliant conversation and, and well done for your work as well. And I hope we get to meet face to face in 2021. We will have to make it happen. Please go. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Thanks, Ebon. Bye.